When you tell people, I'm writing Life of Queen Victoria, they say, not another one. And then you say, well, can you please tell me when the last one was? Well, the last proper one was about 50 years ago, as it happens. There have been lots of books about her, but there hasn't been a whole big biography trying to tell the whole story. Those ones in the past, um, nearly all depended on the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle. Now, the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle are a very important source, and of course I've spent months uh, commuting to Windsor. But they're not the only source. Queen Victoria wrote and wrote and wrote. She wrote journals, which you can now read online. She wrote letters, um, really from her childhood right up to her old age. Now, by definition, most of those letters aren't at Windsor Castle, because she sent them by post. Um, there are thousands, literally thousands of letters of hers in Germany that I've read, which I think many of them nobody else has ever read. In the course of this work, I assumed I was going to be writing The Life of a Monster. Yes. Um, all the evidence, of, and it's particularly so nowadays, but there was a tele program not long ago about Queen Victoria and her children, for example. She was appallingly rude to and about her children some of the time, but I mean, what, what wasn't conveyed by that program was that she was, uh, yes, she was rude, yes, she was unsparing, but she was also very loving. And she was very good to them in lots and lots of ways, particularly the girls. I mean, she sat with them when they were uh, having their babies. She held their hand. She was good in the sick room. Uh, she was, in a way, a hands-on mother, which wasn't conveyed by that program at all. And I, th I don't know quite when it happened to me, but as I was becoming involved with this extremely strong character, I realised I was going to love her, really. And one of the reasons I came to love her was that she was possessed by mental illness, we would now call it, or demons. She came to live through that. Um, she to conquer her demons. And I think that's an incredibly impressive thing to do, actually. A very moving thing to do. I, I came to admire her, that she was a woman, um, ruling over the most powerful nation, later empire, mm. in the world. She had no experience of public life. She had no proper training. Her mother, uh, a rather sweet woman I've come to see, mm. was um, absolutely useless as <coughs> in terms of preparing her for statecraft. And yet here she was, this woman who had actually very high intelligence, though totally uneducated intelligence, uh, taking on this role, sneered at, mocked, distrusted by all the men around her, and yet holding her own, and um, holding her own through very, very difficult circumstances. And the Gladstone papers, these are the really crucial ones, I think, because the Queen had this more or less impossible relationship with Gladstone. They could hardly speak to one another when they were in the same room, so that everything was put down on paper, and you get this wonderful stream of consciousness, really, of the Queen's relationship with Gladstone, which was a very hostile one. When he stayed at Balmoral, he used to see her for perhaps half an hour for the whole visit. And she wouldn't eat with him. Yes. And so that they were having correspondences while he was in the same house. And obviously, uh, the thought of Gladstone made her reach for the whiskey bottle, so that you see in the correspondence, I mean, the letters she wrote in the morning are reasonably straight lines, but by afternoon, and certainly by evening, <laughs> they are all over the place, as she's been swigging the whiskey, which yes. she loved to do, of course. Yes. I think that's one side of her character, incidentally, which hasn't been brought out before, that she was a very, very heavy drinker. <laughs>